anybody would raise their hand to say that they're in the, in the middle of some deal right now that they don't know exactly how it's going to work out? Anybody like that? Probably just about every hand in here because we all are. And you know, um, I've, I've studied in the, I was studying a passage here a while back and uh, I thought I was reading about um, yielding control to God. And what God had to show me and what I had to come to realization of was what I was really reading about was yielding the illusion of control. <laughs> because anything we think we're in control of, it's just an illusion, I promise you. Um, so it's not, it's not about yielding control because we're, we're not giving something up that we don't have. But it's about yielding that illusion of control to say, God, you... You're in control, and I'm okay with that. I'm content with that, and uh, and that kind of contentment is a help to us. It's where that peace in our heart comes from, and I just encourage you to that end. We're going to take a break tonight from the Hope of Glory uh, series, and I want to preach to you for a little bit tonight about the coming revival. I want to try to encourage us from God's Word uh, about that. So I'm going to ask you to turn to Psalm 85, if you would please, tonight. Psalm 85. Do we have any Spanish speakers in here tonight? Other than Miss Becky Lee, <laughs> who has taught languages for most of her ministry. Uh, down in Mexico. I'm so thankful for the Lees and their faithfulness to God down there. Good to have her with her, with us. Uh, the, the word vivir, does anybody know what that means? The word vivir? To live. That's what the word means, to live. It's from a similar root where we get the word revive. And we know when you put, in English, when you put the prefix re in front of something, it means do it again. And so if we've got live and we've got again, then when we talk about being revived, we're talking about living again or being brought back to life. We could say it like that. And maybe not necessarily because we've died, but maybe we've lost the element of life that we once had. Maybe we've lost the vibrancy for life that we once had. And let me just tell you, it's not just a chance that that's happened to us at some point in our Christian life. I'm willing to say it's a certainty that there are seasons like that in our Christian life. Asking God for revival does not mean we, we are a bad child of God, a bad Christian, or anything like that. It means we're an honest Christian. <laughs> it means we're an honest child of God because we recognize like the songwriter said, prone to wonder, Lord, I, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. If we're being honest with ourselves, we have to admit that we all need a freshening of life in our soul from time to time. It's easy to grow stagnant. It's easy to get in a rut and a routine. It's easy to just go through the motions. And the next thing you know, we're not... We're not knowing that peace that passes all understanding like we once did. We don't have that joy unspeakable and full of glory in our life like we used to have. We don't, we don't know the abundance of life that Jesus promised in John 10 like we once had. And there's all kinds of reasons why we can lose those things. But all of them come back to this. Sin. I mean, I'm just being honest with you. It all, it all comes back to sin. It all comes back to uh, putting God on the back burner at times in our life and choosing uh, the pleasures of sin for a season, whether we realize we're doing it or not. David talked about hidden sins. David talked about presumptuous sins. Uh, David talked about secret sins. David talked about asking God to search his heart for sins that he didn't even realize were going on in there, but they were. They were churning and they were disrupting. 
and, and they were doing their damage and we might not even realize it day by day. Can, can I just, I, I'm going to have a lot more liberty to preach this message if we can just get this out of the way. Uh, we're not perfect. So why are we having revival? Well, we've got some biblical reasons why we're going to have a revival meeting. One of it is because we're supposed to assemble together and so much the more as we see the day approaching. And I got to tell you, I see the day approaching. I see us getting closer and closer. We know how things, we know from Scripture how things are going to go in the tribulation period. And in the last year and a half, I can see how they're going to happen. I can see them already beginning to, to the, the wheels turning and, and things set in motion. Now, now look, God might turn that whole cart upside down and wait another thousand years. But something in my spirit doesn't feel like that's where, where we're headed here. I mean, I just feel like the trumpet could, could blow at any time and we could, we could uh, leave out of here and the stage is already set for Antichrist and the spirit of Antichrist has already got that stage uh, completely set and it would, just, uh, it would just require the major characters being uh, put in the limelight and taking their position and we wouldn't have to worry about it because if you know Jesus as your Savior, we're not going to be here. And I don't know if we're going to sit on a grandstand in heaven and watch it all unfold. I kind of wonder how it could be heaven if we were watching what was going on on earth during that time. But, but I know this. I know that all of us, we need to be revived. And so we're, we're adding some extra preaching because if revival is going to come to our hearts and lives, it's only going to come through the Word of God. And only so much as the Word of God saturates our life. And when we, need, when we realize that we need that saturation, then what we do is we just, what I do as a pastor is I just ask for God's leadership and I ask Him to set it on the calendar. If you want to know how I set revival dates, um, I ask God to, to lay a preacher uh, on my heart to come preach to us and then I contact him and say, when can you come? And when he says he can come, I accept that as the will of the Lord for when we're, we're going to need a meeting. And so this happened about three years ago that I scheduled Brother Sam to come. And I'm just trusting that three years ago, I don't know if you can remember three years ago, but we had never heard the word COVID when I scheduled Brother Sam to preach. We, had, we, had, uh, we were not using the word pandemic very often during that time. And uh, very few people in America ever wore a mask during that time. I mean, it was, the world was different three years ago. But God knew what we needed. And God had the man for us, and he's preserved him. And we're going we're gonna to pray that God brings him and Miss Sandy here safe. And let's pray for him that he'll deliver to us um, the word of God. But I want to preach a little bit about revival tonight. Psalm 85. And if there's something here in this passage that jumps out to you that you can identify, don't, don't hesitate to say amen. He says, Lord, thou hast been favorable unto thy land. Thou hast brought back the captivity of Jacob. Thou hast forgiven the iniquity of thy people. Thou hast covered all their sin, Selah. Thou hast taken away all thy wrath. Thou hast turned thyself <coughs> from the fierceness of thine anger. Turn us, O God, of our salvation, and cause thine anger toward us to cease. Wilt thou be angry with us forever? Wilt thou draw out thine anger? To all generations. And then he asked this question in verse number 6. Wilt thou not revive us again that thy people may rejoice in thee? It's almost uh, like what the psalmist is saying here. Is without life from God we can't have real joy in our hearts. And I believe the, the scripture backs that up as, as biblical truth. Without life from God we can't. Pardon me, we can't have real joy. Verse 7, he says, Show us thy mercy, O Lord, and grant us thy salvation. And then here's, here's where revival comes from. I love this passage. I will hear what God the Lord will speak. You cannot be revived without the word of God having effect 
in your life. And God's Word can't have effect in your life if you're not listening. If you don't make up your mind, I'm going to hear what God has to say. Now I hope this is the case every time we come to the church, every time we come to church, every time we open up our Bible for personal Bible reading. I certainly hope as mature Christians and saints of God in here tonight that our attitude is every time God's ready to speak, I will hear what he has to say. But it's also a reality, and we talked about this a little bit this past Wednesday night, it's also a reality that we can make up our mind that we're not really going to listen. We're not really going to hear. Or we're going to listen and we're going to think about how that passage or what God is saying or what the preacher is preaching about, how somebody else really needs to hear that. You know, there's been times while I've been pastoring that somebody's left on a Sunday morning or Sunday evening, Wednesday evening, and said, Pastor, thank you for the message. I was thinking of all the people that needed to hear that. And I haven't, but I've wanted to say, I was thinking you needed to hear that. And just see what they say and, and, and how they respond. But, but the thing is, when God's Word goes forth, it's for you. We shouldn't sit there thinking about, man, I wish so-and-so was here today, or uh, I wish my bitterest enemy could have heard this message. They, they really need this. We need to be thinking about, what's God saying to me? I will hear what God the Lord will speak, for He will speak peace unto His people. Now here's the question. Do we really believe that or not? Do we really believe that God's words are words of peace for us. Now I'm going to tell you why it's hard to believe that sometimes. Because we know us. And we know if I'm going to hear what God wants to say to me, then God's going to want to change some things in my life. And I don't like change. Do you? Am I the only one that just kind of gets comfortable? And, and, and man, I kind of like where things are at right now. And then God wants to go and meddle in our business and make some changes and bring some things to our mind that, that need to change. And, and maybe God wants to reach down in there and, and, and point to an attitude of bitterness that's in your life and He wants to pluck it out of there. And we're sitting there going, but God, I like my bitterness. But God, I feel justified in my bitterness. Do you realize that for some people, bitterness gives their life purpose? Bitterness gives their life meaning. And so when God comes rooting around in there and says, well, this needs to go, there are people, and I'm even talking about Christians, who say, no, Lord, if you take that, what reason do I have to get up in the morning? Lord, if you take that hatred away for somebody then that's going to mess up my whole way of looking at my day. And you say, people don't really think like that. You've, you've probably thought about that at some point or another. And God says, I want to get in there and I want to make some changes and I want to, I want to, I want to convict about some stuff and I want to challenge about some stuff and I want to change some stuff in here. And it's hard to believe that His words are peaceful words because a lot of times when that conviction comes, it produces anything in us but peace. Man, it just kind of sets us on edge. and We feel the guilt of our sin. We feel the weight of our sin. But here's what the psalmist is saying. That the final destination of God's words are peace. They, not, they might not be peaceful when we first hear them, but when we surrender and when we yield and when we let God do what God wants to do, the end result of God's word appropriated in our life is peace. And he says, but let them not turn again to folly. And this scares a lot of people about revival too. If God starts changing things, that means that God wouldn't change something that he wants us to turn around the next day and go back to. The changes that God wants to make are permanent changes. That, that means there's folly that we're turning away from and we're not to go back to. So somebody says, well, 
you're saying in order to have revival, God wants to work changes by His Word that will produce peace, and those changes I should expect to be permanent change. That's exactly right. And once you're there, you won't want to go back. That's what he's saying. Once revival has taken place and is taking place, you can't understand why you stayed where you were for so long. You can't, you can't understand why you allowed those diseased elements of death to have any hold in your life whatsoever. Why? Because life in Jesus is so much better than anything the world has to offer. and Anything our flesh lusts after. And yet, it is possible to sit in church, service after service, and, and be more dead than alive. I said it's possible to sit in church and be more dead than alive. As a matter of fact, I think there's two qualifications of somebody who's more dead than alive. And that is this, unconscious and unresponsive. Would you all agree with me? That, that qualifies somebody who's more dead than alive. Unconscious and unresponsive. Now here's, here's what I want to talk about with us tonight. I'm just going to try to pastor us a little bit tonight, leading up to this revival. And I'm, I want to deal with those two elements right there, unconsciousness and unresponsiveness. And I want to make sure that we understand, we're all on the same page, that there's some things in our church that have a purpose and have a reason that I think we could probably utilize a little bit better when it comes to life in our church, just church life. One of them is this. When God's Word's being preached, we should be fully engaged. Now, I know we don't get through a service around here without some sort of distraction. I mean, it happens. We've, y- y'all know this. We've had guests in our services that don't know what church is like, and they don't even really know how to act or behave in church. And so, man, they're, they're doing stuff, and somebody's looking across the aisle just staring daggers right through their soul, going, what's wrong with you? But let me tell you something. This is, this is true. I want you to think about this. Distractions can abound. But whether or not you get distracted has nothing to do with the distraction. It has everything to do with you. We can stay focused if we choose to stay focused. We can stay engaged if we choose to stay engaged and one thing I'm going to encourage the members of our church to is being actively engaged. What do you mean, preacher? I mean, I mean this. I mean, being engaged in a way that allows the preacher, whether it's me or anybody else, to know I'm with you. Because I'm going to tell you, it helps a preacher. When a preacher is preaching to a congregation, it helps when, when he's preaching and he's looking around. And I don't know any preacher that just stares at one person the whole message. Can you imagine how uncomfortable that would be if you were his target for that message? But I, I, don't, I don't know many preachers that just, they just lock onto one person and that's who, that boy, they're on. That's a heavy burden to, to carry right there if you're that one person. If that's me, I'm going to be looking behind me, hoping that he's just kind of catching me and his gaze going that direction. But I don't know many preachers that just lock in one person. But, but he's looking around, and I can just tell you, because I am a preacher, one thing the preacher's looking for is he's studied, he's prepared, he's going to start at a text, and he's, he's going to go to an interpretation of that text. That's kind of like a point A and a point B. And what he's trying to do is, He's trying to make sure everybody's right there on point A and then we're all going to get up and we're all going to arrive at point B and so as he's preaching and as he's communicating he's making sure because he bears the responsibility and the accountability before God he's making sure everybody's along for the ride 
I can tell you this as a pastor. You don't always get to take everybody with you. And if you focus on that, you won't take anybody with you because if the preacher gets distracted, well, the whole thing's just not very good. So the preacher's got to be focused on the mission and he's got to hope that the congregation's going along with him on the ride, but you're going to lose people. I tell you, I've lost people. Sometimes it's been my fault. Sometimes it hasn't. Sometimes people just aren't checked in. I, I'm not unsympathetic toward that. You know, I've been preaching before, and I've seen some far-off look in somebody's eyes. And because I'm their pastor, and because I know what they're going through, there is nothing in my spirit, there's nothing in my soul that's judgmental about that. I get it. Because I know they're going through a hard time. But as their pastor, I also know this. Boy, they need the Word of God. They need to be on this journey with us. I think you all know, I'm not the kind of pastor that's going up to people. Hey, I'm not calling people down. I'm not going, hey, wake up, Brother Dwayne, wake up. You, you know, y'all have been with me for a long time. That's not the way I do it. I might get loud sometimes. I want, I want people to go with me that want to go with me. And I've preached in churches, thank God not ours, but I've preached in churches, I didn't feel like anybody was going with me. I felt like I was by myself. I'm just going to tell you, not every church that I get to go out and preach to is a live, moving church. I've been in some dead ones. I mean, I've preached to meetings and wondered, what am I doing here? What are they doing here? They, they don't care. And I'm not trying to be judgmental, but I mean, you can, you can tell. They just show up, and they're just trying to fill the time until time to move on. But, but can I remind you about something tonight? We're talking about the eternal Word of God. And we're talking about a God who's so high and lifted up and holy, and yet He wants to speak to us individually. And who are we to tune him out? Who are we to say, that's not really what I'm here for tonight? <laughs> I don't know if you've noticed this at South Campbell, but we place, we place a pretty good priority on the preaching. Because that's what we need. I love fellowship, but this is not a social club. And that's not why we're coming together. We need God's word. Whether I'm preaching it, but Zach's preaching it, somebody else is preaching it. We come together, and one thing that you're going to find every time we get together is somebody's going to talk from God's Word. Amen. Because we need that. We need God's Word. And the fact that God would even want to communicate with us is amazing. And so we need to, man, we need to be locked in. We need to be engaged. And I believe we need to be engaged in such a format that we're, we, by our attention are communicating to the preacher that I'm paying attention. In the Bible, there's a word for that. It's the word amen. Now, I, I'm not the kind of person that, I'm not the kind of preacher that if I'm not getting amens when I feel like they should be there, that I force them out of people. I'm not punching people in the gut going, hey, we... We should be getting an amen out here right now. But you know, you've been around, there are times that I just stop, go back, and say something again. Because I want to make sure we get it. I want to make sure we're tuned in. I know, even for me, while I'm studying these things, some things just fly right over my head. So if that's happening to me while I'm studying, I know it can happen during the preaching. And I'm not even saying I'm the greatest communicator in the world. So I'm not saying it's all on you, but I'm just saying, boy, we really need to, we really need to be focused in here. I can remember growing up in church, and there were times where I'm sitting in the pew, but my mind is so far gone, I didn't even get called back to where I was until the preacher said something that made everybody laugh, and then I'm bummed because I didn't hear the joke. Man, that shouldn't be the way it is. 
We should long to hear from God. We should, we should try to be engaged. Ask God to help us eliminate, eliminate dis, distractions. I don't know if we should stock no-dos at the welcome desk or something like that. And just give everybody a shot when they come in. A shot of no-dos, that's what I meant to say. That's, that was very poorly worded. But just say, hey, here's some caffeine. Let's, let's be engaged. Um, but, but I want to say this. If you study 1 Corinthians 14, and if you study all throughout the New Testament epistles, you're going to read the word amen over and over again. And you know when you read the word amen? It's written by the Bible writer when the Spirit of God inspired him to say something that identified with his spirit about the greatness of God. I'm going to show you that in just a second. Just in one book of the Bible is all we're going to take the time to do. But man, there was the saying of amen. But in 2 Corinthians chapter 14, Paul's talking about prophesying. Now we don't have prophesying in the same sense that they did in, in 1 Corinthians. But we have preaching of the word of God. And so there is similarities. And here's what he said. He said, he said I would rather that ye prophesy. Because if you prophesy, then the, the unbeliever or the unlearned, the unlearned that's in your midst, he, he just talked about this after the saying of amen. And he says this, that he is convinced by all, he is judged by all. Now what that means is that because all things are being done decently and in order, there's one man who gets up and preaches the scripture. There's one man who gets up. Well, if there's just one man preaching, then how is that unbeliever or that unlearned, how are they convinced by all, how are they judged by all if one man's preaching? Because imagine this, you had an unbeliever sitting in a congregation of people and the preacher preaches something that is biblically true and the Spirit of God within us identifies and says that is true. And what happens is it comes out of our mouth, Amen. Amen, when done properly, is not a distraction to everybody. It's actually a call to attention and a verification of a truth that convinces everybody this isn't just the words of one man. People agree with this. People who know God and walk with God and read their Bibles, they are amening this, which the word amen means it is so, or it is true, and it's a verification, it's a confirmation, and so without being a distraction, the word amen is a way to convince all that are in the congregation, this is true. So imagine this, if everybody's got the unity of the Spirit, and everybody's tuned in, and the same Spirit of God is working in every heart, and the preacher says a truth that identifies with someone's spirit, and independently there are people at the same time who say, Amen, somebody who's unlearned, who doesn't understand that truth, all of a sudden they're not just hearing it as truth from the preacher, but they're hearing it as truth from the entire congregation. Church, that's got power to it. That's got power to it. Well, I can't believe this. Our pastor's preaching this because he just wants, he just needs more pats on the back. It, it isn't about patting me on the back. I've preached without amens for years. And I can keep doing it. What I'm saying is this. If we're not saying amen, is it possible that we're missing out on some of the power that God designed to have in our services? where the truth is not just coming from the preacher, but in, an, but in a decent and organized way, that truth is coming from the entire congregation. So when the preacher says something that the Spirit identifies as true in our spirit, and we just simply say, Amen. I, I don't mind a, that's right, that's true. Matter of fact, I'm used to a lot of things. I grew up in Kentucky. I was at camp meetings every year, and the way some people come up with to say amen, well, it's more of a distraction than it is a help. 
I'm just being honest. Am I being? Am I telling the truth, brother? Yep. Yeah, um, I've heard things like that dog will hunt. I'm just going to be honest with you. I get it, but I don't know that that helps in a preaching service. I think it's possible more people can start thinking about dogs hunting than what the preacher is talking about or trying to put that together and fit some, some kind of a occasion. And furthermore, somebody can say amen or that's right, but do it in a way that draws more attention to themselves than to the preaching that's going on. And that's not right. That's not right either. That's not right either. Uh, I think it need. I think when the Bible says, "Let all things be done decently and in order," that's that's exactly what he means. You know what? For the preacher's sake, and I know Amen has a lot more power than just encouraging the preacher. But for the for the preacher's sake, um, even a head nod can give life to a preacher. Especially if he's in a dead congregation. Man, just somebody, somebody nodding their head might just light a fire. And he just thinks, man, I'm not in here by myself. There's actually other people in here with me. Turn with me to the book of, pardon me, I'm sorry I'm having all this tonight. Uh, turn with me to the book of Romans. Romans chapter 1. I, I love these. Th these are all throughout the epistles in the New Testament where the Bible writers are inspired by the Spirit of God to exalt and extol God in such a way that they cannot help but say, Amen. And I think that ought to happen in today's preaching too. Uh, Romans chapter 1, verse number 25. He says, Who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshipped and served the creature more than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. Y'all see that? When the Spirit of God inspired him to write that the Creator is blessed forever, boy, he just had to throw an amen in there. Uh, look at Romans chapter 9, verse number 5. Romans chapter 9, verse number 5. Whose are the fathers, and of whom, as concerning the flesh, Christ came, who is over all, God blessed forever. Amen, he says. Romans chapter 11, verse 36. For of him, and through him, and to him are all things, to whom be glory forever. Amen. He throws it in there. Um, uh, ver chapter 16, verse number 27. Chapter 16, verse 27. To God only wise be glory through Christ Jesus forever. Amen. And I know this is also the closing out of the book, but look what he's saying about Christ. Don't you notice that any time he's given glory to God or specifically to the person of Christ, there's an amen there. There's an amen there. Well, we ought to so want to know uh, God's work in our life that when it's preached about, we're just ready to say amen to the truth about our God. Uh, there's other, I didn't even read all of the amens in the book of Romans, but there's other times in the book of Romans where he talks about um, his desire for God's grace to fill every one of them. Amen. And uh, it's, a, it's a good word. It's a Bible word. And uh, I, because I desire for our services to have everything God means for them to have, I don't think we need to be sitting here unconscious during the service. You know, uh, it's okay to say amen during the song service, too. When a song blesses your heart, there's nothing wrong with saying Amen. When somebody sings a special and it blesses your heart and they get done, there's nothing wrong with saying amen. When the choir sings a song that has a message and stirs your heart, 
There's nothing wrong with saying amen. And it, not only can you be an encourage to the servants of the Lord that are ministering, but you can confirm the truth of the message that's just, that's just gone forth. And it can be a help to everybody. It really can be. 1 Corinthians 14, I'd say the central idea of that entire text is seek that ye may excel to the edifying of the church. And if an amen by the Spirit of God can edify and build up other believers, we ought to let God use us in that capacity. Now, I know somebody say, preacher, that's not my personality. Here's my encouragement. Let God have your personality. Let God work it. Let God change it to where He can use you even in a congregational setting. Um, turn with me to Genesis chapter 12. Genesis chapter 12. <clears throat> what did I say that the, uh, the qualities of being more dead than alive are unconscious and unresponsive. I want to talk about that second one just a little bit, and I want to tell you why we have an invitation. Now, some people call it an altar call. Some people call these altars. I want to set the record straight for everybody in here from from a biblical perspective. These benches do not qualify as biblical altars. I'll tell you why. Because they've been cut and hewn by man. And in the scripture, if you go read about altars, they were never to be they were never to be carved or hewn by man because God didn't want his people bowing down to any object that was man-made thinking that they were doing business with God. So do we have an altar in our church? No, there are no altars in here. And there's a reason why there shouldn't be an altar, specifically, biblically, in any New Testament church, and that is because Christ, has, Christ made of the cross the last altar that we'll ever need for sin. I'm talking about for sin. He turned that cross into the last altar that will ever be needed and gave His life for sin, and so we're not coming in here making sacrifices for sin, and therefore we don't need an altar. This is not an altar. You know what this is? It's a table. It's got a little cabinet in the end of it here. I don't know what's in there. I really don't. All kinds of storage and stuff. Probably communion type stuff, and that is where we set out the elements when our church gets together and, and has the Lord's Supper. But, but this, is, this is wood. So somebody says, I know, preacher, but it's, it's sacred. Be careful. Be careful calling something like that sacred. Because we don't have idols. We don't worship idols. If this thing breaks tomorrow, it's not the end of the worship of the Lord in this church. We'll do something else. I, I prefer to call these prayer benches. Or a place to kneel. Because we're not talking about an altar, but, but while we're talking about altars, I do believe there's a principle of Old Testament altars that do have a function in the local church today. And that is this, that... Uh, look with me, I, I just want to show you this. And this is just one example. But in Genesis chapter 12... The Bible says in verse number 6, And Abram passed through the land unto the place of Sichem, unto the, the plain of Morah, and the Canaanite was then in the land. And the Lord appeared unto Abram and said, Unto thy seed will I give this land. And there builded he an altar unto the Lord who appeared unto him. And he removed from thence unto a mountain on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent, having Bethel on the west and Hai on the east. And there he built an altar unto the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. And Abram journeyed going on still toward the south. So 
here, here's what you have going on here. When there was a time in Abram's life where God revealed something to him that changed the course of Abram's life, Abram built an altar and acknowledged that God had spoken to him and made some change in his life. There's another time where Abram came back to that same altar, and that's in Genesis chapter 13. And if you know the story, you know that God had led him into the land of promise, said, this is the land that I'm going to give you. Abram built an altar unto the Lord, and then when a famine came up in the land, Abram left the place of blessing. He left the place that God told him to go to, and he went down in Egypt, and that did not go well at all. He went down there, he lied about his wife, and then he tried to manipulate the situation, and Pharaoh ended up kicking him out of the country. And so here he comes back into the land of Canaan, and the Bible says in chapter 13, verse number 1, And Abram went up out of Egypt, he and his wife, and all that he had and lot with him, into the south. And Abram was very rich in cattle and silver and gold, and he went on his journeys from, from the south, even to Bethel, unto the place where his tent had been at the beginning, between Bethel and Hai, unto the place of the altar which he had made there at the first. And there Abram called on the name of the Lord. You know what was going on here? Abram had some things to get right with God. And to get right with God, he headed back to Bethel, back to where that altar was, to meet with God again. I don't know if you're seeing this, but the altar became a place to meet God when God was doing something in, in his life. When God was leading him, he met God at the altar. When God was convicting him and there were things that he needed to get, he needed to get right, he went to the altar. Now, look, I'm not saying that we have an altar because we need a sacrifice for sin and we get criticized for having an altar, having an altar call, having an invitation. But I want to tell you why I still believe in invitations. Because when God speaks... God's people ought to be responsive. Because unresponsiveness is a sign that maybe there's more death there than life. Now, somebody says, preacher, I just, I respond all the time. I just don't go forward and I just sit in my seat. I don't make a big issue out of that. As a matter of fact, I'm pretty sure I've realized that from time to time. And I'm thankful that because of the nature of how God deals with us, as individuals and as believer priests, God can speak to us wherever we are and we don't have to have some specific place that we have to go to to meet with God. I'm glad that we can respond in our seat. I'm glad that we can respond driving down the highway. I'm glad that we can respond in the bedroom of our home, in the living room. I'm glad we can respond in the break room at our workplace. I'm, God, I'm glad that God speaks to us at all times, and we can respond at all times. I'm thankful that every time during the week, God speaks to somebody's heart. They're not, they're not texting me going, Pastor, can you open up the church? I need the altar. But I'm not going to quit having altar calls. When the preaching of God has gone forth, because I'm always going to expect nothing to do with me but everything to do with the fact that God's word will not return void. I am always going to expect that when God's word is preached, God's people need an opportunity to respond. And it might just be that as Christians did for decades, if not centuries, that some would find it helpful or useful to not just respond in their seat. Not just respond on their drive home in the car. But we would find a usefulness in our Christian life to say, God spoke to me, I'm going to go forward and pray about that. I'm not going to go to the altar because that's a prayer book. And, and someday we might not have these and a lot of churches don't. Some, it's just the front steps, or it's just the little wall along. But you know what? I still think there's something to stepping out and acknowledging 
God was good enough to speak to my heart today, tonight. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go speak to him. Are you hearing me? You don't have to come up here to meet God. I'm thankful for that. I'm just saying I know for a fact in my life that I've sat under preaching and I knew that if lasting change was going to happen, I needed to do more than just pray at my seat. I needed to move. I needed to step out. If you do it for a show, you're not, you're not accomplishing anything. I, I'm, I'm not going to knock anybody if they decide to be at the altar every message that's preached. But the reality is, it could lose its it could lose its impact if we just do it all the time. Abram didn't do it all the time. But when God dealt specifically with Abram about something, Abram went back to the altar. And I know we're not under Old Testament requirements. And I'm not saying that I'm ever going to pass judgment if I preach every, every service till Jesus comes and nobody comes to the altar. I know, I know so well that is not how spiritual growth is measured in a church by how many people come to the altar. But I can tell you this, if message after message is being preached and nobody's responding, that's probably not a good thing. If people, if the preaching of God's word is happening, and people are unconscious, <laughs> that means like during the service, you know, they're just not there. They're not responding. They're not nodding their head. They're not with the preacher. They're not listening. That's more death than life. And if they're not responding, that looks like more death than life to me. And it might just be what we need is some revival. <laughs> We need, to, we need to be conscious again of the Word of God being preached. We need to be responsive again when the Word of God is being preached. I talked about preaching this a while back with Brother Zach and even asked him to pray about it with me because the last thing I wanted was for, for me to preach this and somebody walk out of here and go, the yeah, pastor's just trying to get more visible results. He just wants more amens while he's preaching and he wants altars full of people crying after he's done. And I'm just going to tell you, that has never been why I have studied or tried to deliver God's word. And it, God helping me, it never will be. That's between you and God. Here's what I'm saying. Are we possibly missing out on the power of some things God has for a local church? Because we need a little bit more life. I'm talking about spiritual life when it comes to the preaching of God's Word. Just a challenge. Just something for us to consider. And when you consider it, if God speaks to you, can I ask you to respond in a way that God would want you to respond? Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. Father, we thank you for your Word tonight. And Lord, I've, I've just tried to give a challenge as a pastor to our congregation. Lord, to just make sure that we're doing what we're supposed to be doing. And God, would you just uh, convict where necessary, challenge where necessary. Lord, I thank you for how you've challenged my own heart. And God, I pray that we would just uh, do what we're supposed to do, God. And uh, Lord, as we look forward to this coming emphasis on preaching, starting next Sunday and, and going through that following Thursday night, God, would you help us to just show up, even this Wednesday night, Lord, just ready to hear from your word, ready to be engaged, ready to respond. Lord, wilt thou not revive us again that thy people may rejoice in thee? Help us, Lord, I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand with me tonight, Brother Zach?